Praise the Lord, everyone. It is great to be in God's house once again on a Sunday morning. And I'm so glad that you have joined us for service here today. And it is our sincere hope that we'll be able to look upon your face in the near future. But uh, for the time being, we are continuing to have our services online. But I am thankful for all of you that have become a part of what God is doing and have joined with us. I'm also thankful for those from other churches, our friends the Merkels and Muskoka and others that have joined us for our services and given us an opportunity to be a part of your ministry uh, to your local congregations. And so we appreciate that. And we pray that you are blessed, that everyone who watches this service and not just watches and I want to again stress right there don't just watch this service if you're looking for entertainment I'm sure that there are more entertaining options out there and it's certainly not our goal or our ambition to entertain you today but it is our goal and it is our ambition to bring Jesus to you and to to worship with you to preach with you to respond with you and to allow God to do a work in your life and so again I'll stress you get what you put into it. Make up your mind right now that you're going to give God that extra measure of response throughout this time of worship today, throughout the preaching of God's Word, because in doing so, you are setting yourself up for success, for the presence of God to come in. And I'm so thankful. I, I can tell you firsthand that, that I have done that myself, and there have been many of these services where I have been weeping tears of joy in God's presence, and God has come to minister to me, and God can do the same for you today. We want to thank all of you that have continued to be a part of our daily devotions. And I want to encourage you Monday through Friday, 9 o'clock a.m., to participate in those daily devotions. And, and I really believe that you will be blessed, you will grow spiritually. And also, to have that daily connection point is so important to, to start your day with God's Word. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And if for some reason you can't join in at 9 o'clock a.m., they are there readily available. You can even go back and at this point, Point. We have done over 43 devotion episodes, and so you can spend all day long, maybe even a couple of days at this point, um, just spending time in God's Word and growing in your understanding. So I want to encourage you to do that. We're also really excited that next weekend we are going to also bring you a second service. We're going to do children's church online, and we've had some requests from, from our kids saying, we want children's church. Well, great news. Sister Kayla and her team is working towards that, and we will be sharing that with you next weekend. So something to be excited about. Also, I do want to remind you that this upcoming Tuesday, the 19th, is going to be our annual business meeting, and we will be doing that via Zoom, and there will be a link that is sent out to that meeting in our, um, our newsletter, email newsletter that goes out to all of you, and so if you're not on that email list, be sure to let us know, and we can make sure that you uh, can be a part of that. We are thankful for the things that continue to happen, um, including preparing for, towards our new church building, and we're excited about the fact that uh, the house next door has been demolished, and in the near future, we are looking forward to finally moving ahead with construction phase. So great things that we're looking forward to on all of those points. We do want to thank you for your continued giving towards the kingdom of God, the work of God, and here is the slide with the information on how to give, if you haven't figured that out at this point, but thankfully, most of you have, and despite all the stuff that that's been going on. Our finances have remained really constant during that time, and that is thanks to God and thanks to you. But we are here today to give God praise, to worship, and to lift Him up. And so let's get ready. Uh, maybe you need to stand up right now. Don't get too relaxed. We don't want you sitting back in your lazy boy. We want you to get ready to worship with us right now. Let's have church. Let's give God praise together right now.
this time we're going to pray together. Um, we're going to pray about a couple things. Let's pray for our minds, our hearts and minds during this time that, that God would help us if you're facing anxiety or stress or fear or any of those things, that, that God would help you with that this morning. Also, we want to pray that as soon as possible that church could open back up as normal so that we could all gather here together. And if you have a need and you feel like sharing that and you want us to pray for it, why don't you just put it in the comments and we'll pray for you this morning and God will meet you where you're at. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. So we thank you for all the many blessings that you've placed upon our lives, Lord. God, we pray, Lord, during this difficult time, God, this strange time, Jesus, that you would help us and encourage our hearts and our minds, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to overcome our fears and our stresses and our anxieties, God, that your spirit would minister to us, Lord, in a special way today, God. We pray, Lord, that your will would be done, Jesus, Lord, and that you'd open the opportunity for us to have church once again, Lord, as normal, where we could gather together, Lord, in, in unity and fellowship, God. We pray, Lord Jesus, for every prayer, God, that has not been mentioned, Lord Jesus, every prayer that's in our hearts and our minds that you see that no one else sees maybe this morning, God, that you would meet us where we're at, God, that you would help us, Lord, and give us the strength that we need. Let your will be done here this morning, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, we had a wonderful time of worship today, and I am so thankful. I do want to see him. Every time we sing that song, I get excited about that, thinking about our, the imminent return of our Savior, and we're looking forward to that day. The signs of the times are all around us right now, and so that should draw our attention to the fact that he is coming soon. We're going to go to the preaching of God's Word today, and there's a message that God has laid upon my heart that I want to share with you today. We're going to read from the book of Psalms, Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. It says, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the new moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I want to talk to you today on the subject, Satan's sleight of hand. And so open up your hearts right now. Let's ask God to speak to us through His Word. In the name of Jesus, uh, God, I pray right now for Your anointing upon Your Word, that You would help Your servant right now to deliver Your Word, God, into the homes and the living rooms, God, of those that are joining us on ser for service today. Uh, I pray, God, that Your Word would speak relevantly, God, and powerfully into their lives, uh, helping them at this crucial moment, God, this very day, Lord, uh, that Your power and Your presence would rest upon us. Uh, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Probably most of you have heard of sleight of hand or what is sometimes called close up magic. In reality, these various tricks, be they uh, card tricks or you know, pulling a coin out of your ear, or making something disappear, uh, a lot of it has to do with manipulating a vulnerability in our vision. God has created our vision incredibly, and our, where there's a lot of things that we're able to see, but our brain works by emphasizing what is important at the moment. And so where our focus is, that is where our brain tunes in, uh, and our vision vision becomes most acute. And so while there are a lot of people that think that they're good at multitasking, uh, studies show that we're really actually not that good at multitasking. Uh, our brains are designed to really focus on one thing and to do one thing well. And so sleight of hand works by manipulating a vulnerability in our vision. Our brain can really only focus on one thing effectively at a time, particularly uh, if we are actually putting our minds to it and paying attention. There is a kind of a social experiment that's been done a number of different ways, and I've seen it done several times. And so what will be done is that the, the person that is encouraging the audience to really focus in on perhaps, uh, in one example, it is counting uh, the amount of times that a ball is thrown. And there are a group of people that are moving around 
around uh, throwing a ball back and forth. And so you are to focus on and to try to do as good a job as counting uh, how many times that the ball is uh, is passed back and forth. Or in another experiment, uh, there are people that are doing dance moves on the stage and they're moving uh, in and out of the spotlight and you are to count uh, how many times they enter into the spotlight. And so people do it to, of course, varying degrees of success. They try to count the passes or they try to count the various times that the dancers move into the spotlight. But at the very end of the experiment, people are saying, well, I saw this number of passes or they went into the spotlight this amount of times. And so the announcer says, okay, that's all well and good. But did you notice the moonwalking bear go through the crowd? And you can see a blank look on everybody's face. (laughs) <laughs> moonwalking bear, what are you talking about? Or in the other case where it's the dancers going in and out, did you see the penguin come and shuffle across the stage? And again, same kind of blank look. And so they roll back the tape in slow motion and highlight, and sure enough, right there in the midst of the people passing the basketball back and forth, there's someone in the costume of a brown bear, and they are moonwalking across the frame. And across the other, there is a, there's a penguin that's going across that turns and faces full on at the audience and then continues on their way. And universally, people did not see it. In fact, even when they know to look for it, uh, about 50% of the audience missed it the second time, and it is because uh, our brain uh, focuses in on one thing at a time. And if you are concentrating on a task, you often do it to the exclusion of all kinds of other things. Uh, Maybe if you're really focused in, uh, I know for myself, if I'm focused in on reading a book, sometimes someone asks me a question, and my brain doesn't even really hear it the first time uh, because I'm focused in on what I'm doing. And so often those that do sleight of hand or close-up magic, they exploit that vulnerability. They intentionally get your focus going on uh, one hand while the other hand does something else. Uh, Maybe the other hand is reaching down and loosening up your watch and taking it off, and a few minutes later after the the diverting hand has done its thing, the magician will ask you, well, would you like your watch back? And everyone, of course, is shocked. Where How'd they get my watch? But um, the downside of this, of course, is that these are the same kind of techniques that pickpockets and thieves will often use as well. Exploiting that vulnerability where people get focused on one thing and become oblivious to what's going on all around them. You see, we are vulnerable when our attention gets diverted. I believe that the current pandemic has revealed a lot of truths about ourselves and about our culture during this time. We have reached the stage as the the hype has started to dissipate a bit and the fear is starting to diminish a little bit. Now comes the, the criticisms and the questions and people are realizing how poorly on different levels uh, that our, our leaders were prepared for this very moment. And th- there will be a rough season ahead as uh, people play the blame game, unfortunately. But more importantly beyond having a limited amount of cushion in our bank accounts, what this crisis has revealed is that for many, many people, they have no treasure in heaven. Very quickly, we are seeing a broad spectrum breakdown in people's mental health uh, because they have no source of help in their lives. And things like uh, suicide hotlines have seen a thousand percent spike. And uh, there are rising uh, numbers of domestic violence uh, incidents and other kind of mental health issues uh, that are spiking. And people are so ill-prepared for This moment. Uh, But a big part of why they are so ill prepared uh, is they have no real source of help in their lives. And for many people, it is the the feeling of helplessness in this moment uh, that has led them to the brink of desperation, uh, hoping that somebody will come through with some kind of stimulus or some kind of of benevolence that is going to help them get through this. Uh, And so, because of that, many people uh, have been obsessively watching the news and the press briefing and the reports from the quote-unquote experts. In fact, there are a lot of people that have reported that one of the things, if they have kind of rebounded at all from this, uh, they did it because they recognized they were becoming obsessive about following the news and looking for information, and they were wise enough to self-regulate and step back and realize, 
I can't do this to myself, but not everyone has been so wise. And there are a lot of people that are on the very brink, desperate for someone to give them answers, for someone to offer them hope. The only other alternative is escapism that so many have engaged in, trying to distract themselves with mirth or medicating their pain and anxiety. And again, I share that studies show that people are binge-watching shows on streaming services, uh, averaging eight hours a day. Alcohol sales are up about 25% during the lockdown, and marijuana sales up 64% in the United States and 80 to 100% here in Canada, with some pot shops reporting sales up as high as 500% spiking. Pornography sites have seen a spike in traffic during the lockdown, which goes to show that in a moment when people are desperate for answers and hope, and they don't get the answers and they don't get the hope, they are putting their heads into the digital sand, distracting themselves with shows and mirth, medicating their pain with alcohol and drugs. I believe what is happening right now is that Satan is pulling a sleight of hand on our culture. You see, this should be the kind of moment that causes some serious self-reflection. It should be a time when people are thinking about their mortality, realizing how fragile our existence is. Even in a peaceful nation like Canada or the United States of America, here we are, we're so vulnerable, we're so easily disrupted, and this thing that has come into our lives has altered the path of nearly 400 million people here in North America and billions of people around the world. So this should be a moment when people are realizing that life is fragile and life is precious and that I need to think about my soul and I need to think about eternity. Uh, this should be a moment when our nation is on its knees uh, crying out to God. We should be like the city of Nineveh, repenting and crying out and saying, God, uh, have mercy on us. Our government should be recognizing that churches are the most essential service of all right now and asking and answering the question, what could be more important than our eternal souls? But instead, people are drinking, toking, and binge-watching mindless entertainment. They are obsessively watching the news from people that talk authoritatively but very clearly don't know what they're talking about. They are scouring the internet for news reports, the full gambit from uh, those that are making excuses to those that are full of conspiracy theories. And people are obsessing over this and obsessing over the numbers and trying to chart and graph and figure out uh, how they should live their lives. And we hear a lot of talk about a new normal. Uh, the word normal means we want to normalize. Uh, we want to be able to keep going on with our old lives even if we have to do it in a new way. In other words, don't make me think about my soul. Don't make me think about change. Don't make me think about mortality. Find me a way to go back to where I was comfortable. And as long as people, as Satan can keep people distracted, he can keep them from turning their eyes to the source of help. Instead of them crying out to God, instead of them recognizing their vulnerability and their need, if he can get them just going on to the next show and reaching for yet another bottle of alcohol or another joint, he can keep them in a distracted state of mind, oblivious to what's going on behind the scenes. John 12 and 40 says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. As long as we are distracted, as long as our culture manages to not really think about eternity, then people have little impetus to change. They're just in a holding pattern waiting for normal to come back. 
We read in the Old Testament, the book of 1 Kings, there's an important moment in the life of the prophet Elijah where he has had a, a major, major victory on Mount Carmel against the, the priest of Baal and Ashtoreth. And so after this point, however, wicked Queen Jezebel has made death threats against him. And so he has run away into the wilderness and he's at a place where he's having a, a crisis of faith in his own life. And, and so there's this key moment where God has led him to a mountain to have a, uh, a come to Jesus kind of moment. And we read in 1 Kings 19 and verse 11, then he, God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. There's a certain truth about God's ways that are revealed in this passage. It's not to say that God will never be in the, uh, the mighty wind or the earthquake or the fire. But what it does mean is that most often God does speak in that still, small voice. The voice of God often comes in quiet moments, not the side of a billboard or with flashing lights. He speaks in moments of quiet, moments like times of prayer or Bible reading or stillness and meditating upon him. Psalm 46 and 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 4 verses 3 through 5 says, but know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. So God emphasizes at multiple points that he speaks during moments of solitude. We see that exemplified in the life of Jesus that very often that when he was in need of spiritual recharge and his own connection as a man with the Father that he would slip away onto a mountain or into the wilderness, a place alone and there in the quiet, often throughout the night hours he would commune with God and his soul would be renewed. And it's here at this point where Satan so often gets us. Uh, he uses distractions to keep us from the moments when God speaks. Uh, how often has the voice of God spoken into my life, uh, spoken into your life, but because we were so distracted, uh, so caught up with ordinary life, uh, or perhaps so caught up with our own entertainments uh, that we couldn't make, we wouldn't make space uh, to hear the voice of God. Uh, you see, Satan wants to keep us distracted over on this hand uh, and so we don't hinder him from what he is doing uh, behind the scenes uh, and it works so much better in this age when we have so many distractions when has humanity ever faced a crisis uh, quite like this in history? I'm not even talking about the nature of this worldwide pandemic because uh, there have been worldwide pandemics before but when has there been a crisis in which those affected have unlimited entertainment to fill their minds. A crisis where a well-oiled supply chain of alcohol and marijuana is deemed essential so people can easily escape reality. Oh, we have made Satan's job so easy for him. This is a moment when God should be, could be, quietly speaking into the hearts of hungry, desperate people. But in so many cases, Satan has all the tricks he needs to divert people's attention while he continues to rob them blind. An age in which churches are non-essential while booze stores and pot shops are essential. What an upside-down world you and I live in. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
You see, Satan wants to keep you from that more abundant life that Jesus has for you. Uh, he wants to keep you distracted, and so he can keep stealing uh, and keep killing uh, and keep destroying. Uh, and I submit to you right now that if you allow Satan uh, to distract you in this moment uh, and to keep you focused on the short term, uh, keep you focused on what is the next show uh, that I should watch, uh, or when is the next high, uh, or what will the news reports be tomorrow, uh, what will the numbers be like then? If that's all you're thinking about, you are being tricked. The master magician is diverting your attention while he continues to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal away and destroy your life and your family and your eternal soul. I ask this question today. If we can't hear the voice of God in the midst of a global pandemic, then will, when will we hear the voice of God? Many of you may have wondered, like myself, how the world would not collectively repent after the days following the rapture. When it's such an obvious sign, an obvious fulfillment of God's word uh, takes place and there's a clear common denominator uh, of those that belong to him. Uh, surely an event that will rock the world and we wonder uh, how could they be so blind as to not repent at that point. Maybe you know a little bit better right now why they won't all repent. And it is because Satan will find ways to distract them. Very likely they'll be caught up in their news reports, and they'll be caught up in their entertainment and caught up in the various trivial things that Satan has that capture our attention so easily and distract us away from what really matters. So first of all, I want to issue a plea to those of you watching today who do not know the Lord who are not right with God, if that's you right now, please, I beg of you, uh, set aside the distractions uh, and hear the voice of God today. Uh, turn your eyes and your mind uh, away from its focus on Satan's distractions uh, and turn them upon Jesus, your Savior. Uh, if you need to pause this video right now and cry out to Him, uh, do it. Uh, confess your sin. Uh, confess your need. Uh, cry out to Jesus and if you'll give him some space to operate, uh, Jesus will come to you. Uh, you will hear his voice speaking into your life. Uh, your life can be forever changed in this moment. Uh, this can be uh, your moment of salvation, uh, the day in which everything changes. But I would be remiss today if I did not preach a message to the church right now as well because we cannot afford to get distracted in the moment when our focus is needed as never before. And I recognize it is difficult, for we are human. We are fighting the same fears, anxieties, and insecurities as our neighbors are. However, the Word of God challenges us to rise above that. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I recognize that Paul was not writing about COVID-19, uh, but he was writing to a church where people were dealing with fears uh, and insecurities. They were uncertain about the future. Uh, and so he says, uh, you shouldn't be sorrowing of those who have no hope uh, because you and I are not alone in this crisis. Uh, there are those right now without hope, but you have hope uh, if you have Christ Jesus. Uh, we don't need to sorrow and we don't need to be afraid as those... Uh, who have no hope, but we do have to change our perspective. If we have found our eyes starting to get distracted, and I recognize, I've heard from some of you that have confessed to struggling with just that, that you have lost the drive and the focus that your ordinary life has, and during this time, you found it easy to slip into some bad habits, maybe some lazy activities, and you are allowing yourself to become complacent during a moment when you should be wide awake, and so I want to shake you a little bit right Right now uh, and let you know that you've got to get your perspective off of the crises uh, and you've got to get your perspective off uh, of the distractions uh, and you have got to shift your attention uh, to the one who matters uh, and to what matters in this moment 
Probably every one of us have had a moment before where uh, our attention suddenly shifted to something else and everything changed in that moment. Maybe it was uh, walking into a house and suddenly uh, the lights flick on and there's a crowd of people yelling, uh, Surprise! And whatever was on your mind that moment before, uh, it suddenly changes in that moment as uh, everything becomes refocused uh, and all the priorities shift in that moment. Uh, or maybe on the, the negative side, you've been walking down a hallway uh, and somebody jumps out and says, Boo! And your heart feels like it drops down into your stomach and you say, uh, You scared me to death! And in that moment, whatever else was on your mind, your attention radically shifts. We need to have a radical shift in our attention right now. I remember hearing from a, uh, a friend and who was uh, teaching overseas, and there was a video that was shared, and when he had, had come home unexpectedly, and so uh, he was uh, hiding in his, his mother's house in the living room, and his mom was puttering along with different things off in the kitchen, and so his sister, who was in the process of filming the experience, uh, tried to get mom to come over to where uh, she could look towards her son and see him, but without being obvious, and so you know all the typical things her you know she's the sister's acting a little bit out of character and so the mom is questioning her and even kind of chiding her a little bit and and so she gets to a place where if she turns and shifts and looks uh, she would see her son standing there and so uh, you know it takes a, a little while but she uh, she begins to shift and she turns and she looks and in that moment when she realizes that her son uh, who she thought was thousands of miles away uh, is right there in the room with her. Uh, you can see the shock and then the joy spring all over her face. Uh, and whatever was going on in her mind before that, uh, maybe she was a little frustrated with the sister uh, a few seconds before, but she's not frustrated anymore. Uh, maybe she was having a down day or struggling with this or that, but all of that runs out the window. Uh, and joy floods in her heart because unexpectedly she realizes uh, that the one she loves is in the room with her. What was an ordinary moment became extraordinary. And you and I need to have a moment like that right now uh, where we wake up to who is in the room with us. Uh, whatever room you're in, whatever place you're in right now uh, watching this message, uh, I want you to know that you need to have an attention shift uh, and realize you aren't alone in that room. Uh, Jesus is right there with you. Uh, your Savior, your Prince of Peace, uh, He is not physically distanced from you. Uh, he is right there with you. Uh, maybe Satan has been tricking you with some sleight of hand. Uh, he's got you focused on death counts uh, and evil reports, uh, fear and doubt. Uh, and meanwhile, while your attention has been diverted, uh, he's been robbing away your faith uh, and he's been robbing away your hope uh, and he's been robbing away your peace of mind and your well-being. Uh, and he would love to steal your salvation while he's at it. But we need to look up from our circumstances to the true reality that God is here. And God is in control of everything. There's another story I love from the predecessor, or the successor, I should say, of Elijah. His uh, successor, Elisha, who comes. And, of course, that's not confusing at all that you transition from Elijah to Elisha. And they do a lot of similar things. But this is about Elisha and not Elijah. And so there is a moment where... He has become the thorn in the side of an enemy, and uh, the, uh, the, this enemy keeps trying to send out raiding parties against the, the king of, of, of Israel, and always the, their army seems to know, or their, their people seem to know when these invasions are coming. And so at first they think it's spies, and then they realize that there is a man of God, there's a prophet that, that is getting insight from God. And so they determine that they're going to deal with this prophet, and they go with a, a great army, and they surround his village, the place where he is, ready to destroy him. And so we pick up in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 14. It says, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 
And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, uh, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I want to start by pointing out that the servant of Elisha wasn't wrong about the armies that were there, about the dangers that were there. And neither are we trying to pretend that there is no crises at the moment. We're not trying to pretend that there isn't a real disease out there that is impacting the lives of people. We're not trying to pretend that none of these realities exist. But what I want you to shift your attention to is to have a revelation moment like this young man did where all of a sudden he saw not only the reality of the danger that was there but he saw the greater reality that God was with them and that God's resources were so much vaster so much greater and if we can shift our attentions beyond the danger around us that's where Satan wants your attention he wants to keep you focused on the enemies around you. Uh, he wants to keep you in a state of fear because in a state of fear, you're easy to manipulate. But what God wants you to do right now in this moment is to lift up your eyes just a little bit higher uh, and recognize uh, that you can look beyond the enemy all around us. Uh, look beyond COVID-19. Uh, look beyond financial disaster uh, and lift up your eyes and recognize uh, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords uh, and heaven's armies are all around us. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, that his armies will encamp around us. Uh, we have a promise uh, that God is with us uh, right now. Uh, and when we look up and we realize how big he is and how small the crises is, all of a sudden faith and confidence will begin to flood our souls once again. We started by reading Psalm 121. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. Think about this. He who keeps you will not slumber. God's not going to fall asleep on the job. Uh, you can rest in peace because God's going to keep watch for you. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Uh, the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God's saying, I'm going to be there. I'm going to stay on the job 24-7. Uh, I'm not going to fall asleep at my post. Uh, I'm going to watch over and I'm going to protect you. Uh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to preserve you. Uh, I'll preserve your soul. Uh, I won't just keep you in the midst of the crises. Uh, I'm the one that can protect your eternity. It is a reminder that we have an ever-present help in the time of trouble. I want to challenge you right now. I recognize that it's been so hard to not get caught up in Satan's tricks, uh, Satan's ways of trying to divert our attention. Uh, and so we are distracted and don't see the work that he is doing. Uh, but I want you to know right now uh, that Satan is vulnerable during this hour. Uh, as much as I have lamented uh, how that many people's hearts are full of distractions uh, and they should be crying out to God, but they aren't. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I've already had testimonies uh, of people's lives who are being changed. Uh, there's a dear man just a few weeks ago uh, who had been away from God for decades, uh, but in the midst of a service just like this, uh, an online service where he and his wife started to watch, uh, and then they couldn't stop watching, uh, and God started to move, uh, and the tears started to flow, uh, and before it was all said and done, uh, he lifted up his hands and gave his life back to the Lord. Uh, and so right now, uh, he is living in hope and living in excitement, because God came to him in the middle of crises. Yeah, he's dealing with stuff just like you and I are dealing with stuff. But there are hungry people right now who need a church who is not distracted, a church who is unafraid, a church who is ready to stand up and say, we have an answer in the midst of crises. We know the source of help. We know the eternal Redeemer. I want to challenge you, church, right now. 
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Get them off of the death counts. Get them off of the the reports that are full of fear for the future. Uh, Quit thinking about second waves and economic reopenings. uh, And turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus is there. And He is in control. He is able to turn your life around right now. He is able to keep you in the midst of calamity. This is not out of His control. This is not beyond His reach. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Oh God, I pray right now, Lord, let your power and your presence move into homes right now, oh God. Let people, Lord, put off the distractions right now and cry out to you. Oh Father, I need you right now. I need help, Jesus. I need help, Jesus. I cry out to you. Turn your eyes to Jesus right now. Take the next little while. Don't run away. Don't get distracted. Call out to Jesus in your own home. As we begin to sing, lift your hands. Let the tears flow. Let God move in your life. Yes, Jesus, I cry out to you. Oh, mm-hmm. 